Hello, I'm Judy Stiles. Thank you for joining us today. We're beginning a special presentation focusing on Saudi Arabia. This is actually part one of two and visiting with Dr. Conrad Gubera, professor of sociology here at Missouri Southern, who had an opportunity to visit Saudi Arabia at the end of 2014. And so for the next two programs, we're going to take some time to look a little bit more in depth at Saudi Arabia. So thank you for being here today. Thanks, Judy. We can use a lot more time than the next two programs, believe me. <laughs> well, you had an opportunity to visit the end of 2014. A um, yes. little background briefly for people who may not have seen the Newsmakers interview that we did. Um, how did you get this opportunity? Well, since 1987, I've been a fellow with the National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations. And uh, every year they'll take junkets of professors. And so this is probably about my fifth or sixth time to go on a trip with the uh, you know, National Council. Mm -hmm. And uh, this time it was Saudi Arabia. And this was really a learning trip because uh, they wanted to expose as much Saudi Arabia to us as possible as far as certainly the urban and certainly the modern Saudi Arabia. So they invited your group to specifically they tour? They invited the them. group. They paid for everything. They treated us, to, if I might say, royally. Mm -hmm. And certainly uh, we were involved with also 10 graduate students. Now, I had two. Uh, in my group, and we had to focus on U.S. Saudi relations and do a full paper on it and certainly present it. Uh, in that respect, I couldn't have had two better graduate students, one from USC and one from Columbia University in Manhattan. Right. So, so this is here day. I am, the Midwest guy from Missouri Southern. <laughs> Coordinating what the graduates <laughs> on the coast are doing. <laughs> so they're dealing with scholars, people who are able to then share this information, I guess ideally with your students Absolutely. and the rest of society. Exactly. That dovetails with the fact that since 1991 I've been teaching a course called the Arab World mm -hmm. within the sociology curriculum. Uh, about 42 students in it this semester. It's always a well-received course. And I find that local students are extremely interested in finding out more about the entire Arab world. And this, this year, of course, I feature Saudi Arabia more than any other Arab country because it's kind of payback for what they did for us in December. Right. So we'll share some information in these programs for the audience at large to find out more about okay. Saudi Arabia. Um, let's start off with the geography and location and so forth. Everybody said, well, it's in the Middle East. Explain <laughs> its a significance of its location. <laughs> well, it is in the Middle East, and it's uh, certainly uh, west of Egypt, and it's east of Persia or Iran, mm -hmm. and I should say west of, of Iran, really, across the Persian Gulf and west of India. Uh, it uh, is a country which we don't think very much about, but it's got 13 different borders to maintain wow. with 13 different countries, mm -hmm. and uh, that is precarious to say the least. It's a modern country having been unified under the Saudi tribe uh, and declared Saudi Arabia as far as its, as far as its official name in July of 19, uh, 1932. And uh, it's the only country in the Arab world to take on the name of, uh, of a family, of a, a, a ruling tribe. There's about 9,000 9, people in the Saudi family, in the royal family. And uh, you and I may have a different view, for instance, of royalty, but in Saudi Arabia, and I think most of the other uh, GCC countries where they do have royalty, uh, they, they like their royal family, and mm -hmm. they support the royal family. And any dissidents against it are really, for instance, about third deviation from the mean as far as, for instance, being, you know, uh, outcasts or certainly being deviant because 80, 90 percent of the people, for instance, support the royal family. So less than 100 years ago actually becoming a country. Actually, 100 own. years ago, this, uh, the uh, Arabian Peninsula, as I tell the class, was divided into two broad areas. This is when Lawrence, Aram Lawrence of Arabia was right. around 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was simply called Greater Syria, which was the northern part. And includes, for instance, Syria and, of course, Iraq and Jordan, Lebanon. And then there was just Arabia, which is now Saudi Sounds Arabia, good. Yemen, Oman, uh, United Arab Emirates, and, you know, those countries to the south. In that part of the world, when people think of the terms of history, it played key roles, you know, 100 years ago in World War One, World War Two. It was, you know, the focus of a lot of world history. Absolutely. We could do a whole afternoon on the difference between the Saudis and the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan in relationship to coordination with the British and Lawrence of Arabia during World War I against the Ottoman Turks who were, for instance, the, uh, you know, who were the, uh, you know, one of the main, uh, one of the main treaty members as far as uh, the Germans mm -hmm. in uh, the German alliance, was it, in World War, War I, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, at that time, you would find that uh, the Saudis were cleverly building up while everyone else was at war, their treaties and their warfare. You got to understand, the tribal societies out in the desert, they were warring people. They had a lot of desert warfare. And the Saudis were extraordinarily good warriors. The Wahhabis that threw in with them back in the latter part of the 18th century were very pious and they were good bookkeepers and scholars. And you'll hear Wahhabism sometimes, and that's a real, uh, certainly, uh, 
I guess you'd say, literal, you know, brand of Islam, which looks at the Quran, mm -hmm. and certainly it is, uh, it, it's the force behind the, the Saudi devotion to Islam, because the Saudis, for instance, were warriors, and, you know, they were converted to Islam, see? And so as a result, for political, strategic, and certainly, of course, I guess, for, you know, even spiritual motives, mostly spiritual motives, I guess, for instance, this is why you have Saudi Arabia. They are the keeper of the holy places, which means Mecca and Medina. Mecca is where everyone goes who's Islamic once in their life to make their journey and their spiritual journey of the Hajj. Medina is the city of the Prophet. That's what it means, and that's where Muhammad is buried. So that Islamic history ties right into their country. Those are the two most important mosques mm -hmm. throughout the 57 countries, which are Islam. Mm -hmm. And every year there's about two to two and a half to three million people come to Saudi Arabia. They're not tourists. They're making, you know, their religious, religious pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're from all over the world. As I say, there are 57 different Islamic countries throughout the world. And the country itself, uh, you know, how do you can classify? We have we hear about you know east and west and north and south. They're kind of right there in the middle of everything. When it comes Very to much terms. so, and in fact, uh, as a result of the Arab Spring, whether they wanted to or not, and I think I've mentioned this before, they've had to take on leadership as far as the Arab world is concerned. Mm -hmm. They're very concerned about what's happening as far as ISIS. They're very concerned about certainly the uh, you know, civil war in Syria. They're concerned about Iraq. They do not want Iraq to be divided into a two-part or three-part state. They want to maintain the hegemony as far as Iraq is concerned. They have absolutely no trust whatsoever in Iran, and they're really, really concerned about Iran developing a nuclear potential as far as weapons are concerned, so much so that they are ipso facto members of the American delegation in dealing with Iran as far as these nuclear problems are concerned. If you'll notice, just last week, Secretary of State John Kerry, as soon as he was finished with these negotiations with Iran, went to Saudi Arabia and to give them a full report. Mm -hmm. They're totally inclusive as far as decision making is concerned. Uh, and of course, they are deeply concerned yet about the Israeli-Palestinian considerations. I'm sorry to say that, uh, you know, one of the, or, or several of the members of the Sharia, we met with uh, the uh, Sharia, which is the uh, personal uh, counsel to the king. There are 30 members, 10 of them met with us the first day we were there, the second day we were there. And they answered every question we had. And I know the members agreed in saying, at the basis of so much of Islamic and certainly Arab terrorism has been the ever ongoing Palestinian and Israeli confrontation. Which is right and down it, the road literally from exactly. them in that part of the world. And they do everything to support Jordan because Jordan is a buffer state between uh, Israel and mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia. On the other hand, I don't think they leave any doubt that if the situation between Palestine and Israel could be worked out, that almost immediately Saudi Arabia would recognize Israel and develop diplomatic and trade relations with them. Hmm. So there's a, that ter really like a tightrope to walk over there. How That's the exactly relations with right. Each other, you know, you know it's exactly right. Uh, and as a result, uh, it's such a it's such a convoluted process in the Middle East throughout the entire Arab world even today that it's exciting to teach the class, but you don't get anywhere because every day you wind up reviewing what the latest argument is or the latest. The news changes almost daily. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the people and the culture. You know, I mean, you know we know where it's at. Uh, obviously, we have images of the desert and the, the, that type of environment, but the people, you mentioned the tribal background. Are there still tribal, you know, how do you unite a country that comes from tribal backgrounds? Like Difficult. That? That's always been the problem of the 20th century, but that's what's happened with so many of the countries throughout the world, Africa, Asia. You know, they've become nation states uh, arising out of tribal backgrounds and certainly the difficulties uh, that tribes have always had as far as some tribes being war with others for generations. Um, in Saudi Arabia, the Saudis pretty much rose to the occasion. In Jordan, it was the Hashemites. And certainly you'll find tribes that certainly have taken the leadership as far as forming modern countries. The Middle East was formed, thanks to Winston Churchill, in the Conference of Cairo in 1922. And the mm -hmm. king of Saudi Arabia that was there, uh, Abdul Aziz. Thanks to the Sykes-Picot Treaty that was secretly crafted in 1915, France and England said after World War I, this is how we're going to divide up these countries. And that's where we got these modern states. It, it chafes many of us to realize and if we were in Arabia, we might feel the same way that foreign powers established the boundaries for Iraq, for Lebanon, 
certainly for Syria. So they weren't natural divisions. They were somebody drawing a map in Western Europe saying. Exactly we're, right. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, you know, part of them were French protectorates or French thought they'd be colonies and part of them the English thought they'd be colonies, but they called them protectorates. Mm -hmm. And as a result, practically all of these countries, except Saudi Arabia in 1932, after World War II, all of these countries declared their independence and sent the French and certainly the British back home. Right. And in the mid-50s, that was the year of change for the 50s for most of those countries in the Middle East. They declared their independencies and tried to forge nations out of their many tribal difficulties. Right. Well, we you know, think about the Islamic influence in the area and uh, the holy places that you've mentioned, but that seems to also tie into the role of the family. We hear a lot Very about that. Very much so. In fact, that's the, the most honored institution as far as the Arab world and certainly in Saudi Arabia is concerned. Speaker after speaker or presenter after presenter said the important thing is the sense of family. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think they invest so much in their homes. And I'll show you some pictures after a while. It's right. some beautiful homes that are being built. And uh, there's money in Saudi Arabia. And you always want to treat your family well and you want to treat your family best. Are these extended and families? These are extended families, uh, certainly three generational families. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing or concept that we know of yet, and I asked specifically this question, of a nursing home. Or, you know, uh, extended right, care someone for... someone elderly. Mm -hmm. You take care of them inside your family, see? And uh, in this sense, uh, the family spend a lot of time with games. Uh, practically all of your Saudi television, it isn't uh, any kind of violence or murder mysteries or, you know, uh, hospital mysteries or anything like this. Mm -hmm. It has to do with family relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like... Uh, continual soap operas, you might say, is a lot of Saudi television and Kuwaiti television. I mean, it's a, and you're looking at other people's families and thinking, wow, is our family like that? You know, I don't want to say it's like Jerry Springer, but my mm -hmm. gosh, you know, you, you <laughs> kind of... Raise some eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, you know, and I've noticed that uh, there's not action-packed movies or anything. It always has to do with people talking and people mm -hmm. concerned about this relationship or that relationship. They play a lot of board games. They, they, they spend a lot of time together in families. So is it a pretty structured society as far as when it comes to the youth growing up or relationships for young people? As a matter of fact, that is very true. And considering the fact that, uh, oh, they say over 600,000 persons in Saudi Arabia now have a degree from the United States, they're deeply concerned about the future of Saudi Arabia and it's changing in mm -hmm. the face of this kind of uh, degree-holding population from outside the United States and, of course, the never-ending effect of popular culture and globalization. They're seeing what's coming in from the West. And they certainly mm -hmm. are. And, you know, they don't know how to forestall that, and they don't know how to hold it back except to keep, you know, the structure of Islam rigid and to say that sin is sin and that goodness is goodness, and as a result, for instance, you know, still fortify themselves with what have been traditional values. So it could be, you know, implications for the future, as you mentioned. Deeply implications for the future. I really think so. Mm -hmm. The literature that we've read and some of the speakers that we listen to uh, certainly there's the concern for moving away from the first generation of kings that uh, are the sons of the original King Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud and now going into the grandsons or some of the lesser, you know, mm -hmm. uh, members of the family. And how does this forebode social change, cultural change, and westernization or globalization? Those are not necessarily pleasant words for the Saudis. And yet at the same time, they are so westernized in many of the things their automobiles and and, and, and their styles, you know, uh, you can have women in burqas, but underneath, for instance, they may have, you know, an exquisite set of blue jeans, you know, and heels and, you know, uh, so really Western being culture Western. sneaking in the, without That really being is, and it's public. especially mm -hmm. true for younger women. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, they may dress traditionally, but believe you me, uh, they have their moments with their really, for instance, oriented toward the West, see? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, um, what can I say? Yeah. <laughs> so when we look at the Saudi wealth, you mentioned, you know, the wealth in the country. Um, people think, well, yeah, there's an upper class that's real wealthy. Is it really spread you know, throughout many people? Well, I'll tell you what. Let's, uh, let's take a look at some of the film yeah, we left off last time. To look at some of the pictures, let us see some and of we can the, see it. the illustrations yeah. of the wealth in Saudi. <laughs> Actually, the, uh, the, um, the uh, ministers, the, the cultural minister at the American embassy said, he referred to Saudi Arabia as a stone stovepipe society. And he said, uh, you know, uh, he said, there's the royal family, and then there's the people who have money, and then there's the people, for instance, who don't have money. And he said, it's not spread out, but he said, it's, you know. It's, it's kind of a vertical out. integration mm -hmm. of the society. So sure we're is. seeing a lot of symbols we're, of the wealth here. Yeah, we're seeing uh, uh, the Dahran shopping mall, huge mall, and they certainly have these styles. I like the idea that they get 25 to 70 sales. percent <laughs> off sales. And look, that's Western garb. Mm -hmm. We saw jewelry in the past. Ah, let's stop watches, and look at this Pause a the watches here. These Talk are men these. watches. These are thousands of dollars worth of watches. I s 
swear, Judy, I've never been in a society where men were more conscious of wearing your wristwatch out here and always looking at the time because that's a very expensive piece of jewelry and, uh, you know, they are deep into men's wristwatches. Show, shows your status and by your watch. Friend. I guess so. And, you know, we've forgotten wristwatches uh, some time ago. Students tell me, well, why bother to have a watch when you see it all, for instance, you in know, your, your cell phone? phone. You ask people yeah, what time it is, yeah. they don't look at the wrist anymore. Right? Exactly, you know. Mm -hmm. But over there, it's like stepping at time back. You can see, for instance, display after display in this mm -hmm. uh, wonderful mall. Now, a shopping mall in Saudi Arabia, they're very proud of their shopping malls because they have some huge shopping malls in Saudi Arabia. And if a shopping mall isn't a sign of globalization in Western culture, I don't know what it's is. It's not a market anymore. It's a shopping mall. That's it's right. A big See, gathering look space. at Applebee's. We're going to have lunch here for about uh, 35 Saudi Ural. That's, uh, yeah, that's about 10 bucks, I guess, really. For instance, so, you know. American culture coming in through the restaurants? Oh, uh, our next set of films, for instance, in our next meeting, I'm going to, let's stop at this one a second. But I'm going to bring in, for instance, the facades for Applebee's and Hardee's and McDonald's and you name it. Mm -hmm. You'll just see how they're dressed up differently. But let's go back to that, uh, okay, that, that slide. Okay, the picture that we, we had, had where we had a picture of a home. That's see, a home? That is a home, isn't it? Every home is gated. Mm -hmm. Every, and and that's, that's probably a good, strong, upper, middle, middle class home. Uh, you can see how big it is. That's Sizable, for an extended right. family. Mm -hmm. And that, my gosh, look at that home. See, how, how would you build something like that here in the United States? See, always behind the gate, behind the arches. And I think the next slide is also another home. Ah, no, that's a brand new mosque. So they're building. That is, now see, that's, that's contemporary and architectural mm -hmm. design. The minaret beside it is extremely contemporary. And certainly, uh, you can, you know, see that, uh, you know, as far as creeping into the architectural design. We can hold that just a okay, second. Pause this one. We talk a little bit about the, the homes. So building your home helps shows your status as well and your wealth. Uh, I can't think of anything more American. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got <laughs> money. I'm going to put it in my or house. More Western, but, <laughs> right. but, uh, but seriously, yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I've got to tell you, I, I, home after home after home, uh, the designs vary. Um, of course, they have no wood. Um, they have an awfully lot of uh, landscaping, mm -hmm. and we'll get into this, I'll say this again, but Saudi Arabia is the third largest consumer of water in the world, and they tell us that. Well, you need a huge amount of water for refinery purposes. Right. They don't have tourists using water, but boy, they use a lot of water for grass. We saw those nice for, plants growing around nice the buildings. nice plants and mm -hmm. so forth, see? Mm -hmm. And the government's trying to figure out how keep the Saudis from using more water facetiously for things like that, see? Uh, and oh, I'm sure they must wash their cars two times a day. You hardly ever see a dirty car in Saudi Arabia. And they have beautiful cars. I mm -hmm. mean, we're talking... Your Mercedes, your high-class, high-end cars, you know? <laughs> America, because of our many interests, leads the world in the consumption and the use of water, followed mm -hmm. by China, simply because of a billion some people that, you know, well, really, a lot of people really with, right? changing in development, and then comes Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And if Saudi Arabia makes the comment, well, you know, we, we have all this refinery going on, but not nearly concerns them as much as, for instance, this kind of use for water as far as uh, private purposes are concerned. And now, if they had tourism coming in and everyone was taking a bath and using water and they're not high on tourism because they've got the religious factor of people coming in, but you could see the problems they have. And so they probably lead the world in desultanization processes, which we want to talk about in the next uh, mm -hmm. meeting, perhaps. Right. Maybe. They have some wild... Well, we will, as far as this next picture is concerned. Okay, let's go on to the yeah. next slide that we had up. This, for this leads slide. right into it. This is one of the refineries. In fact, it may be the newest refinery that opened in 2008 in Jubal City, which is outside of the Haran, and probably about uh, 20 kilometers from uh, or the Persian Gulf or the Arab Gulf, where they load the tankers with oil. We've got some pictures of that coming on. So they pipe the oil from across uh -huh. the country? They sure do. Big pipelines? Big pipelines. Oil and uh, this is a, a, a new a new refinery, which at least they tell us 50% of it is run with solar power and desalinated water. So they're and using new technology, high technology ways of running. They are using high technology in the production of oil. Mm -hmm. And in this regard, they uh, are taking microbes from human feces, putting them in saltinated water, the human feces. And there's a microbe that works and thrives on that salt, which turns itself into a kind of a potash, which can be used for fertilizer, and you get good enough grade water that you can use for industrial processes. Wow. So they're doing techniques that the rest of the world hasn't That's explored. That's right. And, see? Then we, and then the sun is running the rest of it. But mm -hmm. They've got troubles with the sun. They've got the wind, and they've got uh, certainly the dust, right. and all that grit that comes okay. through the desert. And then they've got 
the, the particular lenses as far as the sun glass is concerned is not the same as the office uh, glass that you would have that resists the sun and so they have problems with cracking and they have problems with mm -hmm. these lenses breaking quite a bit. They say once they get those three fig things you know, worked out, they're going to be okay with solar energy. So, so. And that they obviously have that ultimate source of the sun there being in the desert environment. They don't have to worry about those cloudy, rainy days. <laughs> This, 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 uh, exactly, this, this refinery we went to, they proudly say, well, we're one of the newest, if not the most productive output refinery in the world with the greatest degree of new technology. Now we're very talk, proud of that. When we talk in terms of oil, everybody thinks of Saudi Arabia as a major oil producer. How do you classify it in terms of the world's output of oil? Well, we were told that on the average the world uses 100 million barrels of oil a day. You can figure that for seven billion people throughout the 200 and you know 12 nations, 210 nations that we have as far as the world is concerned, Saudi Arabia is responsible for about 30 percent of that. That one mm -hmm. country alone. Yeah. Throw in, for instance, uh, Kuwait and Iraq and the Emirates, for instance, they're up between 40, 50 percent as far as the world's oil production. So you know, at this point in time, historically, you have to deal with them. They're part and of it. they're really working hard at maximizing output with the greatest efficiency as far as uh, certainly the development of the oil or petroleum product. Now, now you can go on with the rest of these pictures. I'll yeah, show we'll some go ahead and talk a little bit more as we're looking uh, at some of the other scenes. Yeah. There's, there's of course, a storage course, we recognize tanks, that, storage tanks. Mm -hmm. And as I told you in the first program, the Saudis want to keep oil low. And they want to keep the price, for instance, at or below oil. $50 mm -hmm. a barrel. And that way it forces Iran, you know, into the market to price their oil low and ISIS to price their oil low and Venezuela so and Russia an and even the United States. For them or an economic it is. It's called mm -hmm. geopolitical economic tool. You know, and mm -hmm. uh, they said for the next hundred years they've got enough oil to keep at the capacity they are for the next 100 years. And so, so they said we're going to play this hand. So they're going to keep pumping that lower priced oil onto the next we market. Mm -hmm. And so it's <laughs> tying that together. <laughs> so here are the pictures of the. Uh, the, the Gulf, this mm -hmm. is what we used to call the Persian Gulf, it's some of the bluest water, my goodness, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a very pretty area. Um, couldn't take any pictures, for instance, I took a picture of the refinery, which I shouldn't have from the bus, you know, and uh, you can't take any pictures when you're there, and you can't take any pictures of the docking or the loading area here. Security concerns. Right? Absolutely, mm -hmm. sure, and I guess, you know, we can understand and respect that, mm -hmm. but uh, here on the uh, east side of Saudi Arabia, where you have the Arabian Gulf, uh, to my surprise, I had no idea. That's one of the shallowest parts of water, for instance, in that whole area of the world. Wow. It's only about 80 to 90 meters deep. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they bring in these huge tankers, they load them, and they get them out, for instance, you know. And in our next program, we go over to the west side of Saudi Arabia and visit, uh, you know, Faust University and uh, Jeddah, which is, uh, you know, a, a city right before you get to, to Mecca. You get up to the Red Sea where they're doing fantastic fish research. Have you ever thought about, for instance, studying fish as a community? They mm. live in communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, they gave us a whole potpourri of material on fish. Fish, when I was fish helps in feed Saudi the people, Arabia. Right? <laughs> right. And, oh my gosh, and they're studying these in the mm -hmm. Red Sea. The Red City, and the Red Sea goes down for thousands of meters. Wow. It's much, much deeper in the mm -hmm. Red Sea, but shallow in the Gulf. So the, the contrasting and sides of the country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who would have thought about Saudi Arabia doing and leading some our extraordinary research in fish, mm -hmm. and in fish research in the Red Sea, <laughs> and something in here. Whoa, we just don't know this back <laughs> Things home. Things that we're learning from them, <laughs> right. Yeah. right? Well, with the money and the oil business, the basically that then is it a trickle down to all the people? How are the you know John Q. average citizen benefiting from that type of economy? Well, uh, they do have a wonderful. I hesitate to use the word, but let's call it public medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, medical doesn't cost them, you know, very much. That's government takes care of yeah. things. Uh, they do have certain kind of government programs for people who will be at minimum wage, as we would call it here in the United States, or in need, mm -hmm. for instance, you know. Uh, the uh, Saudis are beginning, for instance, to uh, fully a third to 40 percent of their workforce of foreign workers are beginning to cut back on those and make more jobs available for the lower class Saudi citizens, yeah, the uneducated group, mm -hmm. hiring their own, for instance, you know, as far as the menial jobs are concerned. Uh, they're beginning to spread that wealth out considerably, to say the least. See, uh, you can have certain kinds of allowances if you qualify for them uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, if you can show the need, kind of like, you know, some of our welfare systems here in the mm -hmm. United States, only they call that charity. 
See? So they're helping they their citizens who need charity. those assistance programs. Well, that's always been the case in Islam. In Islam, uh, everyone was supposed to give 3% of their total income to charity mm -hmm. or certainly to be administered by Islam for people in need, not to support the mosques, but to support people in the community that are homeless or don't have a job or are in between jobs or have certain kinds of needs. And so that's, uh, that license of charity or you know giving has always been a part of the Islamic of tradition. Culture. And so you can see that a lot of the royal family. The royal family will fund an awfully lot of uh, various kinds of ventures to help people, you know, in need, uh, perhaps medical, mm -hmm. uh, clothing needs. Uh, certainly you can find, for instance, that, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, well, I say medical purposes. There's a ton of educational programs, for instance, for people who can't go to the private universities and go to the public universities or the public schools. Everything up until the university is, by the way, for instance, uh, segregated. Boys high school, boys grade school, girls high school, girls grade so school. So there's no mixing of the boys and all. girls in the schools? Mm -hmm. Not at all. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got some lovely pictures of being in a boys high school, and I've got the kids all excited because I'm putting together a soccer team, and I said, let's go, you know, outside and let's play soccer. Who's going to be on my team? And they got really, you know, uh, other professors were trying to talk about how glad we are here and so forth. I didn't say anything about it. So let's go play soccer. They wanted to have say? fun. <laughs> yeah, and boy, I tell you, the room became disruptive, you know, and they looked at me like, you know, but I knew these kids didn't want to hear about it, you know, us. They wanted to <laughs> talk about playing soccer and who was the best, see? And, you know, boys will be boys. Mm -hmm. But my goodness, they, they have programs where these boys can travel to Europe where they actually participate in various kinds of judging contests. For instance, let's say they have sort of like an FFA in their agricultural mm. schools, mm -hmm. and they have judging contests for livestock and crops and so forth. And many times they'll travel into Europe at the government's expense to participate in programs like this. They don't have necessarily sports teams, but they do an awful lot as far as the intellectual and pragmatic kind of participation. Great. So they're really encouraging that educational growth of the youth. And Very much so, and with a hands-on sort of uh, effort as far as at least their, their high school youth particularly. I was just mm -hmm. amazed when high school students said, oh, yeah, we've been to Albania, we were to Romania, we were Poland, for instance, uh, we were in Berlin, you know, and these were all programs sponsored by their school in which they participated in some particular kind of uh, academic or certainly, uh, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, pragmatic kind mm -hmm. of contest. Tying them mm -hmm. together. Well, there are so many different things we can talk about, and I know we have a lot we can talk about in the next program. Uh, tell me a little bit. We talk about the government relations, politics. Uh, we also have uh, the society a little bit more. So for people who are watching, you know, kind of a teaser of what we can talk about in the next program. Well, I think in the next program we certainly want to talk about U.S., uh, certainly uh, U.S.-Saudi relations right. and where those are headed and how strong those are and why they're that strong. We certainly want to talk about women and how they're changing in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, bring in an artifact and wear it in the next uh, program, uh, cleverly made by a women's university. Uh, we we'll want to talk about um, uh, their university system, 22 major universities, and they're extremely oriented toward technical education and information uh, technology, and particularly research. They're extremely research-oriented. Uh, they want to begin to offer services to the world aside from just oil. Mm -hmm. We can talk about, for instance, there are 1,300 export companies in Saudi Arabia that are making such things as tin cans. And they're exporting agriculture. Gosh, they export a lot of milk and ice cream down to the UAE as far as certainly their tourist attractions are concerned. Right. Only two dairies, but between the two dairies, they milk 35,000 cows every day. 24-7 and produce a heck of a lot of milk. I bet. <laughs> well, it sounds like we have some interesting <laughs> in topics. Saudi in Saudi Arabia, I mean, exporting milk. Have yeah. you thought about <laughs> Saudi Arabia exporting milk? No, it blows your mind. <laughs> well, Dr. Gabera, I look forward to visiting you with you in the next program. Thank you for being here today. Well, thank you, Judy. Thanks for putting up with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I invite you to stay tuned because we're going to have another program following up a little bit more about learning about Saudi Arabia.